Welcome back, everyone. Joining us today on the podcast is our resident YouTube philosopher, Vlad Vexler. He actually was on the podcast six months ago. If you want to go check out that podcast as well, I'm very excited to have him back. Vlad Vexler, thank you so much for joining the channel again. It's good to be with you, Jake. So how many, how many subscribers are you at on the main channel now? About 120k or so, and maybe at about 50k on the second channel, where I do the more casual chats. I do uh, occasionally tune into your Q&As. I always love getting your perspective on uh, current events and what's been happening with the war. So for people that might not know you, uh, why don't you give your own brief introduction? Sure. I'm a London... UK London based political philosopher. I grew up in the Soviet Union. I left just before the Soviet Union collapsed. I'm writing a book about politics, about political freedom at the moment. And I live with a significant health condition that leaves me only two or three hours per day during which I work. And a big part of that has become a kind of public intellectual conversation that I've begun in the last year or so on YouTube, and it's been a real privilege to carry that on. And uh, so that's, I think, a bit about me. Well, I'm, I'm glad that YouTube has allowed uh, you to share your uh, perspectives and insights about what's been going on in this war with the world. Uh, I know there's lots of people out there that appreciate it. So my first question for you is, how has Putin managed to remain in power? This was supposed to be a special limited military operation lasting three to maybe seven days, two weeks tops. Here we are over a year later. The war is still going on and somehow Putin is still in power. What's your perspective why there hasn't been a palace coup yet? I think, you know, Jake, the war was started for Putin in part to consolidate power, actually. So there's a kind of a regime security reason for the war, as well as a, if you like, escalation against the West reason for the war. The two are connected. And Putin felt that the country could take an extra totalitarian turn and consolidate via this escalation against the West that he expressed by brutally invading Ukraine. So that was his logic. I think what happened so far in practice is that he has grabbed more power into his own hands relative to what he had before the war. But that power is, I think, now more fragile, much more fragile than it's ever been. In terms of a palace coup, I think that one of the most striking things about this political system if it's a system at all in Russia, is the unbelievable negative selection of the people that have got to the top. I mean, these are either people who are ideologically sympathetic to Putin or indeed even guiding him, or they are people who are pathetic, quite frankly, and some of the worst people in the country. They are loyal completely instrumental in their thinking. They are sort of um, completely unable to think for themselves or to draw any kind of a red line. And these are probably the worst group of people on earth from whom to expect a coup. So the only way they're going to do a coup is if they feel much more personally threatened by the prospect of Putin staying on than they currently do. We can do a lot about this. We can put pressure on them, for example, by having conversations about a post-Putin Russia and directing some of these conversations toward these people, trying to split these Russian elites off from one another. But the point is, at the moment, they are pathetic, gutless, cowardly, and loyal until they feel um, extreme existential risk. Um, at that point, they will act. 
We keep hearing these reports of people falling out of windows, but it's not been any of the people at the top, such as Medvedev, Lavrov, Gerasimov, or Shoigu. None of these guys are ever going to turn on Putin because their fate is tied to Putin. You stated in one of your videos that Putin is trying to smother blood or cover his own people in blood in order to co-opt them into supporting this invasion. Can you talk about ways that Putin has been doing this uh, to the Russian people? I think when I said that I was talking about the mobilization that Putin started in autumn, and the logic is once people are involved with this brutal war that he's conducting, they're going to feel bought in because this is going to be a war that's going to cost them the lives of their relatives and so on, and they're going to feel, well, perhaps this wasn't a great war to start, but now that we're in it, let's win it. So there is, unfortunately, quite a bit to that way of looking at the war in Russia at the moment, and the regime is trying to stir that up. Um, they are also trying to divide the population in terms of people who are somehow involved with the war and they're people who are going to get extra protection and extra benefits versus people who are not. And quite generally, Putin is engaged in a little bit of um, redistributive policy now too, trying to make sure that the worst of people in the country are not uh, too alarmed by the situation. I mean, for example, um, there are something like 25, 26 million children in Russia, and about 10 or 10 and a half million of them are getting a government benefit. So there's quite a lot of conservatism and preemptive action around trying to keep the population on board. But I think more important than any of what I've just said is the fact that I think since we last talked, Jake, the propaganda has changed. When, when we last had the conversation, all the propaganda was the kind of postmodern propaganda that tries to confuse you with mixed messages and tries to make you feel that nothing is true. And that's rather the opposite of the Soviet style of propaganda, which said, no, there is a truthful story. There's a story that I would, we would like you to think of as true, even though, of course, it isn't. And that's what you've got to believe. So it's a kind of an alternate reality propaganda versus a postmodern propaganda where people are inclined to have fatigue from the information environment followed by apathy. What's changed is that they've now introduced a little bit of that Soviet-style alternate reality propaganda. They're still doing the mixed messaging. But they're also saying, no, 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 there is now a story of a war that involves all of us. It's probably going to last years. In fact, it might not have properly started yet. We are going to be involved in this war, all of you, all of us Russians. And we're going to have to prepare the younger generations for this as well. And you are seeing an extraordinary transformation of the school system. Um, and I mean, you, you've you've worked in the school system before, and you you know just what a precious and sacred thing it is to educate children. And now, Russian children of all ages are being pumped with the story that there is going to be a big confrontation with the West coming, and they need to get prepared for it. So there have been various techniques of getting the population on board. But there's also been this extraordinary change in the way propaganda works. I would say 30% of the propaganda now is about this clear war message. And that's at odds with the postmodern approach, which actually doesn't care what people believe. It just wants to confuse them. Now they want to say, look, you do need to think of this as being a major war that is somehow about to happen in the next few years, some major confrontation with the West and our national mission is about getting ready for it. And moreover, the ideology of the state now is getting ready for that war. So every Russian that I've spoken to, Artem the Russian dude, Zach the Russian, uh, they've made the similar argument that you have that 
the overwhelming majority of the Russian population has been depoliticized. This depoliticized blob in the middle, with 15 to 20 percent of Russians probably being against this war, but they can't publicly take that position anymore. And then 15 to 20 percent being enthusiastic for this war. They want to escalate. Do you think since mobilization and now that we're past the one year mark, is that depoliticized blob finally starting to shrink as a percentage? Are more people going to one camp or the other? I think it's a great question, Jake. The answer is broadly no. They are still fundamentally depoliticized. But we've seen a few trends, and we don't know if they're going to last or if they're temporary. So one trend is that perhaps a few more people have clarified themselves as being fundamentally opposed to the war. But another trend that's perhaps even more substantial and even more worrying is that the number of people who are positively pro-war has increased. It's still a minority, but it's increased. So it was less summertime and autumn time, and now it is more. And that's an expression of the fact that there is a kind of a pro-victory party in Russia now. A lot of folks who are more radical than Putin himself, and they're unsatisfied with him, and they are gathering some support for themselves from the population. One of the things that makes this, I think, really hard is that you can't trust polls in tyrannical regimes the way you could trust a poll even in Ukraine. You know, if, if we ask Ukrainians, Ukrainians are roughly going to tell us what they think. Um, that's not quite true in Russia. So we've got to approach polls with a pair of pliers, but I, it's not completely wrong to talk about polls, if, especially if they're cleverly done. So I think the last, one of the last significant efforts to poll the Russian population and make an analysis of that is up on a wonderful platform called Re-Russia that's run by Kirill Rogov, a really good Russian expert. And what they try to do is get around the bottom of um, declarative statements from Russians and see what they really think beneath. Um, and here's basically the outcome they got at the declarative level first. 60% of Russians answered that they support the war. 10% said that they are positively against it. And 30% refused to answer, which is not a neutral position in a, in a society where you're threatened to go to jail if you answer this question the wrong way. And people are fearful of polls in Russia. They think that the government is somehow behind them, even when it's not. But what's fascinating is that they then ask those 60% pro-war people whether they support any pro-war policies. For example, they ask them questions like, do you support unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops? Um, do you uh, prefer investment in war policies or investment in uh, social issues and education at home? How do you feel about people who are avoiding the draft? And what they discovered is that out of that 60% who said they supported the war, only 40% went ahead and said that they supported particular war policies. Um, so I think that's a kind of curious illustration of how there might be a gap between people's declarative statements and their position underneath. Now, Nevertheless, 40% is a heck of a lot of people supporting such a brutal and genocidal um, invasion. Um, but having said this, um, there is clearly an indication that so many people are not in a position of having a fixed view, that they, they, are, they are sort of still um, uh, uh, evading facing this properly. Um, and I think the way to take this sort of poll summary I've just shared is to half take it seriously and half just be skeptical because 
of the fact that th this is a poll done in a tyrannical regime. And if you are skeptical, then the default position should be that most people don't have a fixed view. And then on either side, there's a pro-war and an anti-war party. One little final remark about a poll like that. Don't make the mistake that every single person who says they're against the war are against the war for the reasons that you and I are. There'll be a small percentage of those people who are against the war who actually feel we shouldn't have invaded Ukraine because we should have invaded Kazakhstan or Estonia. So there's also that demographic too. Um, in fact, I'm surprised it's not bigger um, because this war has proved to be so disastrous. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we've also got to be honest, there are people in Russia who oppose this war uh, who are still of a very imperialist disposition. So that's roughly where we're at. We still have a, a majorly depoliticized population. And what's so tragic you know, for us to witness here is that the more atrocities that depoliticized blob in the middle senses are happening in Ukraine, the more terrified they are to look at that reality and properly face it, because it'll mean them recognizing that their whole relationship with politics has gone to, you know. And the only way out of it is to give them the sense that there is an alternative to Putin, that there is an alternative to some kind of a permanent war against the West. And that's a job that I think the Russian opposition need to do a bit better than they're doing now. And we should support them with that. Let's say that, yeah, the depoliticized blob, they're picking camps, and the camp who's in favor of the war is growing. Maybe it's up to 40%. But you said in one of your videos, and I agree, that a lot of those people are just doing it because their president says they have to do it. They don't really understand the reason why, but they want to have faith in their governments. They want to have faith in their presidents. You even said that if a year ago Putin had come out and announced he was giving up territory to Ukraine, people would have supported it. They wouldn't have understood why, but that's what their president is saying we got to do. If Putin had decided we're going to start bombing Russian cities, if it's not, as long as it's not St. Petersburg or Moscow, most of the country probably just would have gone along with it. I think that's a really useful exaggeration. And there was a study recently that looked at the extraordinary role of um, inferred justification in the way Russian citizens think about their regime. And I think that's a very fruitful idea because the number of people in Russia who think, well, this is so nuts that they wouldn't have done it, our government wouldn't have done it unless they had a reason for it, is really high. Now, we know this too. We, we've got citizens in the West approaching their political representatives like that, but it's a matter of degrees. The degree to which folks in Russia are prepared to allow that there must be some kind of a special reason that Putin has for this, um, that degree is, is stunning. So that's quite a fascinating concept, this business of inferred justification, that the war must be right because Putin wouldn't have done it otherwise. Do you think there's some kind of uh, psychological or historical punishment awaiting the Russian people when this war is over? Let's go ahead and say that Russia has a best-case scenario at this point. They hold on to some territory. They get an armistice from Ukraine. I don't think this will happen, but let's do a hypothetical here. They managed to get out of this war, uh, but then they have to reflect on what they did. And they started the largest land war in Europe since World War II, in which they lost over 100,000, probably closer to 200,000 of their own soldiers. How would the Russian people digest that historical fact uh, once it's over? Well, you know, Jake, that brutality we're seeing in Ukraine isn't just something terrible that regime is doing. Um, it's an expression of what that regime is all the way to the core. And so what the reckoning will be for Russians is that they, as a society, um, while 
being in the death throes of a kind of imperialist syndrome um, cascaded into um, a kind of on many counts fascist tyranny with a completely magical revanchist project on which every part of the state, every part of society was tied. So when this breaks down, and it'll break down no matter what happens in the next few months or year or so um, in Ukraine, because this project fundamentally cannot succeed. It's an empire trying to stand on legs it no longer has. So it'll crack. But the question for Russians will be, what the hell what the hell are we as a country? Um, what holds us together? And are we capable of making a um, choice that is compatible with something like a modern democratic republic by decentralizing? Or are we not? And are we on some kind of journey to disintegration into several different states? And I think that is going to be actually more painful than the consequences of the sanctions, than the um, economic challenges they're going to face. Um, it's going to be a country without a project that will need to work out whether there's anything that holds it together. And there might be good answers to that question, but that's basically the question they're going to face. And I think the longer this goes, which is to say the longer there's a situation where Mr. Putin is not stopped, the worse the predicament the Russian population will be facing at the end of it. You said a country without a project, and I think the project would be keep going. You know, if, if there's an armistice, rebuild for five years and then go for more chunks of Ukraine, go for Moldova, go for the Baltics. I, I, I've made the argument I don't think Putin's ever going to stop. He's all in on reconstituting the Russian Empire or the Soviet borders, see as far as he can get. But that is the project at this point. I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, w when I just answered your question, I actually, in my mind, had um, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, in mind the business of the entire war against the West, because I believe the regime is now simply tied to that. I don't think it can detether itself from it. In other words, if Putin withdrew from Crimea tomorrow and all Ukrainian territory and held on to power somehow, which would be hard, this would not stop. In other words, I don't believe there is any way for this to stop uh, until that regime collapses. I think that Putin and his regime are simply tied to this project of an escalation against the West. And the only reason that stuff that you talked about is not going to happen, hopefully, is that they're simply going to crumble or run out of capacity. But even fully kicking the Russians out of Ukrainian territory tomorrow, including Crimea, is not going to stop this. Um, so that's, I think, a really important realization because we in the West are having this debate still about whether Putin can stop by himself or whether this is something that now will keep rolling and rolling and rolling until we stop it. So I actually think what you said is really important and it's exactly the right analysis. And we need to talk about more why that's true. In your video talking about evil and politics, you stated something interesting I hadn't considered. But you said that if Putin had won quick, if Zelensky and his government had fled and they successfully took Kiev in three to seven days, people in the West would have said, yes, that's really evil, but what Putin just did was brilliant, uh, recapturing Ukraine. So there's this kind of uh, gray area where people in the West or even Western governments, they respect brilliance even when it's being committed by an evil person. Uh, to illustrate this, within the first week of the invasion, former President Donald Trump publicly said that Putin was a genius for invading Ukraine. 
Now, obviously, he didn't have all the facts yet and how disastrous it would go, but he dodged the question whether or not it was horrific or moral for Russia to invade Ukraine. He just looked at the quick sheets and what Western experts were saying how badly it would go for Ukraine and said, Putin's a genius for doing this. Why do people, why do you think people excuse bad behavior if you're good at it? That's an amazing question. I think that one thing that I think is a big part of our ethical world is an unfortunate tendency to think that ethics stops once it exits our circle. There is a tendency to feel that if we are loyal and empathetic and generous and loving with our group, whether it be our family or our community or even our nation, that somehow that kind of ethical consideration stops. And I think it's really worth reflecting on how that works. And I do think that there's a kind of a global crisis of this. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of us who feel that ethics stops when it comes to others who aren't us, and that we are very good, very ethical people, because we do care for everybody who is around us. But then I think if we focus specifically on why Putin may have got a lot of people on board if he had succeeded, um, at least succeeded in Ukraine, he would have failed in the end anyway. I think that's a fascinating conversation. I think a part of it is the crisis of trust in institutions that we're experiencing in the West and a consequent temptation to think that we have been betrayed completely and irredeemably by our political institutions and our leaders and that maybe something far away um, is better, something we don't know much about, uh, but something that kind of from a distance looks authoritarian and charismatic, well, maybe, you know, maybe there is something to that. Maybe that's a better way to run society. Now, of course, as soon as you look more closely at Mr. Putin and his regime, you see that, um, you know, uh, everything that already worries us about our society is true to a power of a hundred in Russia. Um, so it's not it's really not a good destination to aim at, but I'm afraid that there is quite a lot of latent support for Mr. Putin in Western Europe, certainly. I think that there are people in France, there are people in Germany who would have woken up and activated themselves had Putin done this. And there would have been the feeling that, you know, maybe it's not ideal, but it's next to his border, it's kind of his. Um it's more his than ours. Forget about Ukrainian autonomy and sovereignty um it's it, you know it's probably closer to his sphere of influence and now that he's done it there's no point to complain about it and on it would have you know on it would have gone from there actually so that was a worry that i had that has not been completely allayed actually because i think there's still some scenarios um worth worrying about but uh, it would have been quite disturbing how many political figures and commentators would have come out trying to normalize this situation, you know. And it's it's very important to be clear-eyed about this. Um, and it's not just about evil. It's about evil that affects us, you know. There's a, there's a kind of a tendency to think that this is this is sufficiently far away from France or from Germany, but it's not. And it's a, a process of escalation against all of the West, um, all kinds of good reasons to call it evil and to call that regime evil. And it's not just coming for Ukraine. Ukraine is taking a hit, as it were, um, for, for us in some sense, because this is not a war against Ukraine fundamentally but for Mr. Putin. This is a big escalation against the West and um I think we've got to be awake to it, and uh, we we could have we could have dream sort of you know uh, uh, we could have dreamed our way into conceding more and more to Putin had he been successful at his acquisitions. And I think it's very important that we're not doing that, um, and it's always important to 
it's always important to care what things are happening on in other parts of the world um and you know that's both ethically compelling but it's also practically constructive if we go back a year and think about those first 72 hours president biden offered a ride for president zelensky and his government and zelensky said i don't need a ride i need ammunition i'm staying well let's pretend it wasn't zelensky it was somebody else who was more craven and took that helicopter ride to become a government in exile in London. And uh, the Russian military took the capital, reinstated whoever uh, as a pro-government figure. The Ukrainian military accepted it and stood down in the Donbass region. If all that had happened uh, 13 months later, I, I don't think the world would be talking about Ukraine. I don't think I, I think there would have been sanctions, but as long as it wasn't too, I think a lot fewer uh, pictures and videos would have gotten out. But if Russia had just taken it, the world would have put on some sanctions, but Putin had saved up $600 billion to get through it. And we all would be back to business as normal. The Nord Stream pipeline would be flowing. People would have just accepted it and moved on moved on to the next world catastrophe that probably is, is coming soon. I don't know. It's it's weird to think about the alternate realities that we could possibly be living in, especially for the Ukrainian people who would have been doomed to maybe another century of rule from the Kremlin. Of course, there's just no way that Putin could have captured ideological control of Ukraine because the... Um, anti-colonial movement is so strong now in Ukraine and there's a real coming together um, and the recognition that they're not Russians, <laughs> there's a, that they have a very, very separate history um, and a quite different culture and that they are historically on the wrong end of... Um, extraordinarily dark imperial policies in you know across russian history from the soviet period to the um russian empire period but if they had managed to install a kind of puppet in kiev maybe somebody like medvedchuk i think that the degree of normalization of that would have been quite worrying in the West, and that would have encouraged Putin to plan his to plan his uh, plan his next steps. Eventually, I believe he he would have lost, no matter what, he would have lost Ukraine. Um, but the costs would have been greater. Um, the human suffering, the destruction of lives and livelihoods would have been greater, not just in Ukraine but in other countries he may have invaded. Um, so this is. This is a worrying scenario, and it's a scenario still worth thinking about, because you can just imagine a war that freezes for a year or two, and us somewhat normalizing that Putin has part of Ukraine, and then Putin somehow managing to um, renegotiate some of the isolation of Russia from the global economy because, for example, different politicians might be in power in the West in 2025, 2027. And then somehow maybe Putin might get to a stage where he tries to invade Eastern Estonia. And then he's going to wait to see how we react. And so that kind of scenario is highly unlikely, but it's not impossible to such a degree that uh, we should be casual here. Um, this is something that isn't going to stop un unless we stop it. In a recent video, you broke down the cultural and historical significance of Putin annexing Crimea. And for people in America, th this might be lost on us, but apparently Russians view Crimea as their their link to classical Greek culture. This was news to me. We didn't learn this in school. Can you explain this uh, myth or this concept uh, in, in Russian culture? Well, this 
extraordinary obsession of fetish with Crimea, I think goes back to Catherine the Great and her so-called Greek project. And it, it, it's a logic that's rather difficult to reconstruct, but basically the argument is that Russia, via the marriage of a Kievan prince um, to the daughter of a Byzantine emperor, has links with Byzantium. And Byzantium, just in virtue of historical derivation and geographical proximity, has links with ancient Greece. And that therefore, um, Russia's connection to ancient Greece is at the core of its modern civilization and allows it a kind of um, one-upmanship on Europe because supposedly European countries are less connected, according to this myth, to ancient Greece than the Russians are. So the Russians are, in a certain way, um, absolutely primary as a culture in Western civilization, according to this myth. And that myth looked like it might die during the Soviet period. But surprisingly, it didn't. It got magnified. Crimea was idealized. Um, there is even this extraordinary development of um, architecture in Moscow in the 1930s, taking on a kind of Mediterranean feel to mimic um, the sense of um, Crimea as being Russian. and the myth basically got consolidated during the Soviet period. I mean, even I, growing up as a kid, had sort of a, a, a rather magical images of Crimea in my head. It was a five-year-old. Um, now, that does not mean that you go and steal somebody's territory, but it means that there was a kind of a cultural layer there that Putin could tap into and exploit. And that's what he did in 2014. How can how can Putin be so anti-European in his rhetoric today, yet be promoting these historical pro-European uh, historical figures like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, and this history of Crimea? How can you be saying Europe is bad, Europe is full of Nazis, but also look at our pro-European history? We're the we're the best Europeans. I think that Russia's anti-Europeanism is a kind of complement to Europe in reverse. Russia is not a culture that's separate from European civilization the way China is. Russia is spectacularly dependent on European civilization to make sense of itself. Russian literature is European. Russian music is, is a branch on a tree called European music. And so very often I see, um, you know, a, a lot of value in saying that Russia's anti-Western position is a product of a complete normative dependence on the West um, and is a kind of complement to the West in reverse. The argument that is often heard is that Western culture has given up its uh, true conservative values and that Russia is there to resuscitate those. And of course, that's complete bunkum. There's, there's no validity to it at all because it's not as though Russian, the Russian regime is in a serious way culturally conservative anyway. It doesn't believe in all of this propaganda it's spewing out about um, you know, gay and transgender people in the West. Um, this is just a bit of political technology. Um, but what's uh, fascinating is that, that they think that that's an effective way of persuading some folks in the West that Russia has a contribution to make to the West's evolution and to the West's sense of itself. But the truth is... All of this story that we are truer European conservatives than the Europeans is nonsense. Family values in Russia um, are 
absolutely not consistent with that idea. Russia is a heavily atomized society. It's an enormously secular society, despite the presence of the church. So um, there's a kind of a, a, an amazingly made up story that often takes this, the form of this argument that we are more European than Europeans. Um, because we are the true heirs to European conservatism. But in terms of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great's project of turning westwards, I think it's fair to say that that's the, clearly the opposite of what Putin is doing. And um, it, it's also fair to say here that this is Putin being uh, a very selective and a very amateur historian. So with um, Chinese President Xi visiting Moscow recently and, uh, you know, watching these clips on Kremlin State TV where they say that their future is China, closer diplomatic military relations with China. Do you think, you know, once again, if the Putin regime can survive this, do you think that it will really come to this point where in Moscow and St. Petersburg, university students are studying Chinese uh, rather than English, German, or French? Is Chinese really going to become more commonly spoken in Russia than other European languages? I think that things are going to go in that direction, but I doubt they'll quite land in that spot. I think we, they might not get that far. The only way they could is if the society consolidated and continued to um, escalate its totalitarian elements, and then the regime could just say, well, you're learning Chinese now. Um, more and more Russian school kids and university students are studying Chinese now, even before the war, that was a trend. Um, I'm not an expert on the Russian school system, so I don't know the exact ins and outs of, uh, of how they balance c compulsory and optional languages, and often that keeps changing year, year in, year out. Um, but I do think that the regime will be inclined to get people incentivized and maybe a bit pressured to study Chinese rather than just simply making it compulsory. But we're going we're gonna to have to see what happens. But the, the basic trend is that uh, inevitably Russia is going to look toward China culturally. Yeah. Do you think that Russia and China can ever be trusting and altruistic allies? What do you think China thinks of Russia right now? That Russia is a very, very good resource to exploit. Uh, it's a resource that's in a very vulnerable position and it's going to be inevitably heavily dependent on, on China. I'm not a China expert, but I think one of the fascinating stories here is the way that um, the Soviet Union was historically the big brother and it was the center and China was the periphery. Well, now it's clearly the other way around. Um, Russia is a periphery that is at risk of becoming to China what Belarus is to Russia. And if I had to make a prediction, I would say that what we're going to see in the immediate term is a great deal of economic dependence on China. But I think a little after that, we may well be seeing China taking partial control over Russian politics and Russian foreign policy and telling Russia to do this or not to do that, and so on. So we're going to see, I think, increasing political leverage because I do think from over over Russia by China because Putin has embarked on what might be an ir irreversible pattern of selling out Russia's sovereignty to China. And what's going to be fascinating is when this regime collapses, whether that track will be reversible. I think what's going to be hard to move underneath is that Russia is fundamentally a country that looks to Europe, um, certainly in, in the big ur urban capitals. Um, but the, the political drift here is um, very, very disturbing if, you, if you're a Russian who cares about Russian sovereignty, which Mr. Putin claims to.
I think we're about 11 months away now from the 2024 Russian presidential election. If Putin is still in power and this war is still going on, how do you think this uh, election next year in Russia is going to go? I think it's, you know, a moment of vulnerability for the regime because obviously there's going to be no real election, but the theater of the election is an opportunity for this regime, like a kind of um, plebiscidal monarchy, if you like, to demonstrate that it has the support of the people and that the people feel comfortable putting their fate in its hands. So that needs to be somehow demonstrated, somehow seen. It's, it's a kind of a process of acclimation that has to be visible at that point. And so I think they're going to focus seriously on the election. And uh, that's because it, it, it is genuinely um, a moment of vulnerability for regimes like this, even though, of course, um, the election is completely is completely unreal. But the, the theater of it is, is an important stumbling block for the uh, regime. And if Putin continues to experience disastrous defeats in Ukraine, um, then it will be interesting to, to see how vulnerable how a vulnerable regime manages to, manages to get through it. Um, it probably will, but um, it's not it's not an easy hurdle for, for them. Russian media recently showed pictures and videos of Putin visiting Mariupol and Crimea. Uh, I want to ask you, what's your position on the body double theory? Do you think the real Putin actually went to Mariupol, or do you think it's uh, it's a body double? I don't want to spoil anybody's party because I, th I think a lot of people have a really good time counting Putins and working out which one's the real one. There is no doubt. <laughs> there is no doubt that Putin will have at least one double, and that they'll be tasked with things like you know uh, driving in a similar car in the presidential motorcade and so on. My sense of the opinion on this among Russia, long-standing Russia experts, is that the majority of them think that it was real Putin, uh, probably 95%. But there is one man who came out saying that he's convinced it was a double, but he, he, is a, he is the man who's um, largely responsible for most of these uh, articles we see in the West about Putin's imminent death and Putin's imminent, imminent decline of his health. What I would say as a piece of advice is try to focus not just on still pictures, but on some kind of a sense of Putin with his speech, with his body language, with his demeanor, and then make up your mind on the basis of that. I think that's really important. Um, and sometimes knowing the language and knowing Putin's style of communication can help. My personal sense is that that was Putin and that that was Putin driving the car and that's a very Putin signature move. But I don't want to impose that on anybody because this is such an exciting potato to throw around. My, my advice would basically be um, let's judge it on the basis of the moving pictures and the sound and compare that to Putin's mannerisms, compare it to... Uh, his sort of way of being in his body. And if after that, you still think it's a double, good luck to you. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to complain. What gives me confidence is I have this clip of Gherkin from two months ago saying, yeah, it's a double. A real Putin is not going to be shaking hands with anyone. One, he's a germaphobe, but two, he's afraid of being poisoned or assassinated. So Gherkin because I have this clip of Gherkin saying Putin uses body doubles, that gives me full confidence to say it on my channel. But yes, uh, the guy driving the car, you know, the guy meeting with actors outside of that apartment building, he does look a lot like the real Putin. Uh, if, if it is plastic surgery, uh, that surgeon in Switzerland earned his paycheck.
And I think the really important thing is that that whole setup was fake, right? Even if that's the real Putin, that whole setup was fake. These are not real people. And, you know, we're hearing the cry in the background from the woman. This is made up, which you put in one of your recent videos. This is made up. Uh, don't trust this. I think that that's the, the really key uh, takeaway. And that's the, the basis of our analysis of the sort of propaganda move that that, that was. I think we eventually will know the truth uh, when the real Putin expires. My next question concerns the International Criminal Court's arrest warrant. Do you think Putin cares about this? And uh, second part to this question, by issuing this arrest warrant from the ICC, is this Western government's officially giving up on ever going back to having normal relations uh, with Putin's government? I think that Putin is a bit emotionally impacted by it, but in the scheme of everything else that's going on, um, he doesn't care much. The way he would be impacted is that he feels this sense of rejection from the West. And this will be a kind of, you know, extra nail in the coffin of that rejection. But um, he will not think that it's a big deal and he would not be surprised by it. But it's very important that, you know, other people will experience that as a bit of a wake-up call, other people in the Russian regime. Because if we look at this woman, the Russians, uh, Russian uh, children's um, commissioner or children's rights ombudswoman, whatever her position is. Um, she's young and she is probably in real trouble now. And there's every possibility the future Russian um, government could exchange her in, uh, um, you know, uh, um, in exchange for, let's say, a lessening of the sanctions and so on. Um, so we kind of think of these Russian folks as giggling about it. But if you and I woke up tomorrow with an, with an arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court, even if we knew our country wouldn't give us away, this would be very stressful. So I actually think it has a healthy, it has a, a, a healthy bracing effect on middle-ranking people in the regime in particular. Um, in terms of whether it means we've given up on Putin, I think it's a move in that direction. But my note, which given my analysis of the war, I would call a pessimistic note, is that there are still people in some Western European capitals who just wish that Putin would calm down, realize that he had made an irrational move, and climb back into his shell so that potentially we could negotiate with him later. I still think that that is um, an important part of um, the economy of sentiment about Putin in some Western capitals, even though my personal analysis would suggest that um, Mr. Putin is now done. He is tied to this large-scale war against the West. His regime is tied to it, and the negotiation needs to happen with other parties, but not him. But I don't think that's a sentiment that has completely percolated through all Western capitals yet, in my view. I asked you this question six months ago, and I'm going to keep asking it, but at this point, realistically, what is the best case scenario for Putin and Russia going forward? I think that in the very best case scenario, Putin's imperial outburst will collapse and fail. But the question is, how far can it go? So I suppose, what if we speculate about uh, best case scenarios for Mr. Putin to prolong and escalate this. I suppose it looks something like what we almost touched on a few, you know, a few minutes ago, that if Putin is allowed to keep a part of Ukraine, and that's kind of frozen over and consolidated, and if he happens to be in power a few years from now, 
he'll try something else. And that could be, um, you know, not just Moldova, um, but maybe even a, a NATO state. Um, so there's no reason why Putin couldn't try to uh, chop off a bit of Estonia in 2026, 2029. And what's our reaction going to be? That's going to depend on the solidity of our democracies. It's going to depend on us not having elected a bunch of Viktor Orbans in major Western countries. But if we have three or four Orbans in, um, in power in major Western countries, we might say, well, you know, what are we going to do? And Mr. Putin still has faith that Article 5 will fail when tested in practice under the right conditions. Um, and so even if that extraordinary scenario ever occurred, I still think Putin would lose in the end. But I, I do think that this sort of scenario is, in fact, unlikely, but not unrealistic and not impossible. And as a result, I think we need to take seriously this, this issue that this is a project that will not stop by itself, Mr. Putin's project. It's something that we have to stop. Um, and unless we do, it's going to keep on rolling forward. And this, I think, raises important questions about, you know, how we support Ukraine. I think Putin's master plan, or at least what Kremlin propaganda puts out, that they just need to hold on for Western support for Ukraine to weaken. Uh, the, the plan over the winter was to have energy prices skyrocket so that consumers would be upset with their governments. And then these countries would have elections. They would, they would elect leaders that would um, cut support for Ukraine, not be pro-Russian, but would cut support. And we're just not seeing that happen. Uh, elections in Italy, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, um, the candidates who are supportive of Ukraine are, are winning pretty decisively. So this is not not going well for Russia. Vlad, we've hit the one uh, the one hour mark. Uh, I, I do want to give you an opportunity. Was is there anything you wanted to uh, talk about or ask me? No, I just want to say uh, thank you for doing what you're doing. And it's been a privilege to uh, witness your your channel um, evolve. And I just want to acknowledge how much, um, you know, craft and commitment there is in what you are sharing with the world. And I want to, I want to um, honor that and uh, just share that that's how I feel about your work and um, let your community hear that too. Thank you so much. I always... I mean, no one's no no one's more surprised than I am at my success on the platform. Uh, I, I I've been, you know, watching YouTube since it first launched in 2006, and I actually did launch a YouTube channel back in 2012. I uploaded two videos, and I'm not going to share them with anyone because they're so bad. But I I watched all these YouTubers uh, experiencing success. And for the longest time, I just said, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that could ever do that. And then um, I've told this story before in the past. I watched a video on Graham Stephan's channel, How to Get Your First 1,000 Subscribers. So in mm -hmm. 2019, I was stuck in Minot, North Dakota for the Air Force, and I was looking for something to do, and I, I took it as a personal challenge. Can I upload videos about something just to get to 1,000 subscribers. That was my entire goal. Uh, I started uploading videos and didn't even tell family and friends. I just wanted strangers somewhere on the internet to find it first. And uh, it took six months, <laughs> and I uploaded 60 original videos, but I hit that 1,000. Mm -hmm. And that was enough to get monetized. And as soon as you're making 20 cents a day, I mean, how, how can you stop? <laughs> so uh, I just kept going. and. <laughs> I'm, I think I've reached the point where I can't even stop. Like the idea that I would just stop making content for YouTube when at this point I built my entire life around it. Uh, and I'm incredibly grateful for the community that I've, that's been supporting me and the success that I've had. I, I don't take it for granted. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a very positive attitude about my job. YouTube is my job at the moment. Mm -hmm. I'm not crazy about the subject material in that 
this is a horrific war in which there's lots of tragedy and I'm constantly engaged in it. Like I can't, I can't disengage because talking yeah. about it is now my job, but I, I keep a positive attitude. And, you know, when I end my videos, I always end them with these feel good clips. They're, they're for me as much as they are for mm -hmm. the viewer, uh, just to mm -hmm. maintain my sanity and, and maintain my morale. And I think, you know, it, it, it's just astonishing how many people are out there um, desperate for, uh, you know, good quality content that helps them make sense of the world and helps them feel that the world is not a completely hopeless and despairing place. Um, and, you know, we are struggling quite a lot in our informational environment. and any positive contribution to it, I think does really, really make a difference. Um, you know, if hundreds of thousands of people are, are helped to be in a, in a healthier and more robust relationship with the you know, difficult world around them, I think that's a wonderful thing. Very well said, Vlad. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on the channel. Uh, we might have you again in six months uh, if you're up for it. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Uh, if you've made it this far in the podcast, what are you doing? If you haven't already subscribed to Vlad's channel, he's got the main channel and the uh, Q&A channel. I'll link them both in a pinned comment down below. Till the next podcast, uh, thank you, everyone.